doldrums of 1984. If you're a stockbroker trying to make a living at a time like this, you rise with the birds and you run hard just to stay even. It's one of the worst summers in a decade. The market has been dropping for 14 straight months. On the vast trading floor of the Toronto Stock Exchange, the traders sometimes sleep, but the machines never do. Somewhere in the world, in time zones from Singapore to the city of London, on trading floors very much like this one, someone is always buying and selling something. 7 a.m. The colts are already stirring in their stables in the Caledon Hills, north of Toronto. This is where you live if you're rich enough to be a gentleman farmer. Austin Taylor, gentleman farmer, financial godfather, chairman of the third largest investment firm in the country, Cloud Young Weir, marches into battle. Six foot six and weighing in at more than 275 pounds, he's as calm and assured as the huge Clydesdale horses he used to ride. But these days, he's leading a fight for survival. A lousy stock market isn't his only problem. He's worried about the competition, which is the rudest and most savage in Bay Street's entire history. Like all businessmen, he also keeps a wary weather eye on the political climate. In the election summer of 1984, what the politicians decide can help determine whether his proud old firm lives or dies. It's no time to leave public finances in the hands of dream makers if all they want to do is buy the voters with their own money. Jeez, I feel good. Jimmy, I feel good. 7.10 a.m. Glenn Moore, Cloud Young Weir's top Toronto salesman. No, he, didn't. He, was he generates at least half a million dollars a year in commissions. He hones his body and his mind like an Olympic athlete for the storms and stresses of the Bay Street jungle. 7.20 a.m. Kenny Rathgaber, McLeod's head floor trader. If you want to buy or sell a stock, it's floor traders like Kenny who do the actual buying and selling. He's a frontline foot soldier in the endless contest of wits fought out every working day on the floor of the Toronto Stock Exchange. A 10-mile bike ride behind him, Glenn Moore devours information like a starving man at a banquet. Before the commuter train pulls into Union Station, he's already absorbed the financial pages of three newspapers. All night, all day, from all over the world, by ticker tape, by telephone, by lunchtime gossip, the information funnels into a few square city blocks of high-rise real estate that constitutes the financial capital of Canada. But what does Bay Street really do? Simply this, the street transfers money from people who've saved it to people and in institutions who want to invest it. Whether you know it or not, it's your money they're playing with. You've probably got an indirect stake in Bay Street through the shares your pension fund buys and sells on your behalf. Some of your money is loaned out to governments, companies, and individuals. But tens of billions more is invested in the stock market by large financial institutions and by more than two million hopeful Canadians. 105 bid, 5,000 the market. It's guys like McLeod's floor trader, Kenny Rathgaber, that's the tartan of the clan McLeod he's wearing, who take your order and try to buy or sell your stock at the best price. Really? And you were the only buyer, too, if you're out. Shit, you're really trouble. And then I went right up again, so... Yeah, yeah I saw you along about four grand. Hey, Smitty! And it's guys like Glenn Moore, the silver-tongued salesman, who talk you into buying. Okay. Well... It's quiet again. 8 a.m. as Austin Taylor wades into another sea of troubles. From the top floor of a black tower in the Toronto Dominion Centre, Taylor's firm buys and sells stocks, bonds and commodities for thousands of customers. It raises money for companies that want to expand and for governments that want to keep on spending. It's big business. More than 1,200 employees, 360 salesmen and 38 offices across Canada and abroad. More than 130,000 McLeod clients depend on the skill and judgment of all these people. And all these people depend on the judgment and survival instincts 
of Austin Taylor. And I guess all we've got left on the books is PWA. In the office next to Taylor, That's his alter right. ego and McLeod president, Tom Kearns. And we did a million shares of Union Gas yesterday. And so, you know, I think we're coming back all right. And so I think the worst is now behind us. But Jesus Christ, it's been bloody murder. Down the hall, Ian Delaney, vice president of corporate underwriting, is trying to raise about $35 million for the Mercantile Bank of Canada. The following firms. Dominion Securities, Richardson Green Shields, Burns Fried, Maryland, He's put together a syndicate of investment firms that will work as a team to sell Mercantile shares to the public. Which are not particularly material. Good morning, sunshine. How are you? But it's brokers like Glenn Moore yeah, who do the question. actual selling. Did you get to the bank? Okay. That's fine. No rush at all. Okay, no rush at all. Um, we have until August 1st anyway to make a decision on this Canada Savings Fund. But also, Jack, um, do you know offhand, I'd like to talk to you, how much free cash you have available, if any? Okay, for you and for the trust. Hello? McLeod's executive committee meets every morning in Taylor's office. Today, there's a serious snag in the mercantile bank deal. The biggest Canadian investment dealer, Dominion Securities Pitfield, is a member of the syndicate that Ian Delaney has put together. I would be surprised, but I'd be very surprised. But D.S. Pitfield has threatened to pull out of the syndicate unless they get a bigger piece of the deal. If they don't get their way, McLeod is worried that they'll spoil the deal for all the others, buying all the shares directly from the bank for resale to their own customers. I guess it was on Thursday last week, uh, DS said that they wanted 10%, or they would drop, right, Tom? And if they didn't drop, or if they weren't given their 10%, they would drop from the account. Uh, the bank is quite pleased to have uh, everyone at 8%, and doesn't want to make an exception with uh, DS Pitfield. We have to go back this morning and make a decision as to whether we're going to uh, uh, agree to the, uh, their request or have them drop from the account. My feeling is not to give them a 10%, but I'll certainly go along with whatever. These so-called bought deals are a symptom of savage new competition on Bay Street. Instead of the chummy, clubby way it used to be, these days it's every man for himself. I don't want to be put in the position where DS walks through the door at 9.30 this morning, puts a check on the table. We walk through the door and we feel compelled to put a check on the table at 10 o'clock. The long and the short of it is, we have been doing more of that recently than any other dealer in the country. And we are clogged up. We just, you know, we, we just don't. Uh, I don't have enough confidence uh, that we can sell the merchandise out the other end. What's your reaction, Tom? We're no more plugged than DS is. No. And uh, the fact of the matter is that they're going to buy a deal. No. If they're going to buy a deal or threaten to buy a deal to win the business every time, I think we've got to let them do it. That's all. I think we tell them to take a walk. Well, I think we'll give Even them the courtesy of another half hour, hour. They said they'd be back in 15 minutes. Yeah. That was 15 minutes ago, but we'll wait to hear from 10 them. 10.30? I think we'll wait to hear from them. Yeah. Wait till 10.30 and hear from them, because we don't want to lose it. We don't want to be put in the position of having the whole No, but I, I would like to see this issue if we could in the marketplace sooner rather than later. Yeah, as I say, well, we're, right now, we're just... 10 a.m. sharp. The siren is Kenny Rathgaber's signal to make the day's first trade. Bid CDCB. Just 100. It's another slow day. Part of the problem is interest rates. They're so high that people can get an excellent return on their money just by sticking it in the bank. Since Bay Street lives off its sales commissions, that's bad for Kenny. It's bad for his firm. Burns and Daly are out there selling the Alcan at 7 8. 10,000 shares, 33. But you wouldn't know it was a slow day on McLeod's trading desk. This is where the buy and sell orders from customers across the country are relayed to the trading floor. Batten, batten A. McLeod's head trader, Fred Ketchum. Cross 11 8. Al can offer it an eighth on the floor. Pay the offering side right now. Cross 11 8 at 13 and 3 quarters. You're pro in the buy. 
you discussed him with me as to whether we should call on him this morning? Uh, he may be. Okay. I'm just, uh, I didn't hear back from him. Oh, well, hopefully not. Uh, Every Monday morning, Taylor chairs a meeting of McLeod's board of directors. There are 58 directors across the country and enough in Toronto to fill the long boardroom table beneath the gaze of D.I. McLeod, who founded the firm in 1921. Good morning. Russell, you're heading up. The uh, markets last week were fairly quiet. The U.S. markets. The directors all work for McLeod, and together they own 90% of the company. Government financing, 1.1 billion. The weekly board meetings are a chance to catch up on the latest deals and the latest gossip, and to hear whether their company is worth more or less than it was last week. Um, the economic news continues neutral to slightly negative. Last week on our. At the moment, the firm is worth less than it used to be. Times are so tough that Taylor has laid off 60 employees, ruthlessly cut costs, and reduced the salary of senior executives, including his own, by 23%. In terms of our own firm, I think uh, we've had six good consecutive years. And uh, psychologically, I think it's, it's good to have one of these flat years uh, so that everyone recognizes that we're in a business of risk and it can go against you. This is the worst year we've had since I've been down here. In fact, for Bay Street, it's been one of the worst years since the 1930s. In the mythology of Bay Street, the great crash still lingers like the specter at a feast. But the stock market is only a mirror of reality, not reality itself. The crash of 29 didn't cause the Great Depression. The vast human tragedy that began on October 29, 1929, was only a reflection of an economy that was crumbling from within. Seven months to the day after the crash, Austin Taylor was born in Vancouver with a silver spoon in his mouth the size of a shovel. I led a very sheltered life. Certainly I suffered no economic hardships as a result of the, the crash in terms of my family environment at all. I had a, a very happy childhood. The estate where Austin Taylor grew up still stands on South Granville Street in Vancouver. Austin Taylor Sr. was a mining tycoon, a financial genius and a secretive, lonely man. Hobo jungles were springing up across the continent. But the young Austin Taylor grew up in a private golden world of riding, of tennis, of sunlight on dappled lawns. He acquired a taste for tea and cricket at St. George's School in Vancouver. I recall to this day my <clears throat> embarrassment of being driven to my school by a chauffeur. Uh, being the only boy in the school that arrived in a chauffeur-driven Cadillac, uh, Obviously, the, the way my parents lived was not the way everyone lived. Taylor was a failure until his 40s. He flunked out of Princeton and UBC, learned the investment business in New York, and went broke in the Philippines. But after joining McLeod's Vancouver office in 1964, he finally became an achiever. In 1978, the directors asked him to move to Toronto and salvage a troubled firm as president. In five years, he doubled its size and quintupled its profits. The rich kid from Vancouver who never found himself became one of the most powerful and respected men on Bay Street. You have to have two agreements. And that's right. the agreements with the selling shareholder. Taylor's role is somewhere between godfather and corporate marriage broker. With McLeod's senior lawyer, he wades through the fine print of a top secret takeover deal involving three large companies effect or execute the agreement with the selling shareholder. I think you can if property drafted in part. While one deal simmers on Taylor's desk, he gets news of another. Tom Kearns reports on his latest triumph. 
arranging the sale for $280 million of a gas company owned by Norsen Energy Resources Limited. Well, the words are coming in now. Uh, if both parties agree to the words and sign them back from Norsen, it will be an agreement in principle that will be public knowledge and announced on Friday. Very good. Eddie's raised the price three times. Uh -huh. Eddie's raised the price three times, and Kalashuk got him to come up. And uh, has uh, um, all aspects of the agreement been... Uh, uh, no, it's not signed back yet. No, but who pays whom? Well, Eddie agreed with me on a fee. Oh. Uh, it's all right. The agreement was at three and a half million bucks. Three and a half million dollars is McLeod's commission on the deal. After further tough negotiations, McLeod received less than half this hefty fee. This deal is so secret that even Taylor and his lawyer refer to the companies as A, B, and C. Tomorrow, Taylor will chair a meeting in a downtown hotel where all three parties to the proposed deal will come together for the first time. It's a role he enjoys, and he's one of Bay Street's best at playing it. Well, it's exciting. There's a contest associated with it, usually. However, it's a question of whether you are following or devising the right strategy, the appropriate strategy at the time. Have you considered all the factors? So there's an element of excitement. There's an element of challenge. It's a contest during the currency of the situation, the third party comes in at 19. Does C kick in in that event? Hello, Moore is my name. We completed those transactions yesterday, my friend. Big we deals like mergers happen every month or so, but the little deals happen by the thousands every day. Glenn Moore makes 75 phone calls a day to his top clients and his long list of client prospects. Reinvestment for the RRSP. One strip we can do on a 1365 basis, maturing 1987. Very nice. This is one, of our, yeah, this is one of our smaller dining rooms. But it's lunchtime, and the game goes on. <laughs> Glenn Moore uses one of McLeod's private dining rooms to butter up a prosperous retail client. We do a lot of entertaining in-house because that way we keep it private. The firm may be struggling, but the crystal is polished, the wines are rare, and the talk is all about money. They went up about 15 million shares back. And, uh, and investors who handled their stock in did quite well. Oh, yes. It yes. Very well. It was an excellent buyback. They sip Seagram's products as they talk about no, Seagram's uh, stock. Example, sales, total assets, book value per share. Ray Betteridge is a McLeod securities like analyst shares, 20, who follows the stocks of distillers and makers of consumer been, uh, products. Betteridge down, has been invited to this lunch to, to convince Glenn Moore's client that Seagram's stock is a bargain. Ask me, the 4704, if you had to replace the shareholders I yeah. I estimate that it's worth $68 a share. In your view, the stock has a good possibility of doubling. Is that what you're saying? In my opinion, yeah. Over the next cycle, which could be two, two years. Two years. Yeah. And I indicated okay. to you that I think there's $50 worth of oil and gas in it. Yeah. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. And fill out my purchase order. <laughs> <laughs> but suppose you're not rich enough to get invited to lunch at McLeod's private dining room. Where does the little guy look for investment advice? Well, there are hundreds of self-help books to choose from. And increasingly, the little guy is subscribing to investment newsletters. For anywhere from 35 to several hundred dollars a year, you can buy timely, independent advice from some of the best brains in the business. If you're one of the 90,000 Canadians who subscribe to the money letter, for instance, you're buying the thoughts of a canny Hungarian who's won and lost several fortunes in the stock market, well, easy to Andy have. Sarlos. I think you can envisage a roller coaster. And I've been in a roller coaster ride for the last 15 years. Sometimes the ride takes you to the top, and sometimes it brings you to the bottom. The important thing is that you remain a player in the ride. And I was lucky enough to do so. 
I made a lot of money on the market. I lost more than one fortune, and I came back again. And that's the name of the game. When nobody likes something, that's the time to be a buyer. Ian McAvity is one of Canada's highest profile investment gurus. He runs his own newsletter and manages a mutual fund that invests in gold. He's also a star attraction at investment seminars across North America. Fear and greed are the dominant forces in the marketplace. Uh, when you see a market that is frothing away, rising, and it's in the headlines of the newspapers, and it's the lead item in the evening news on television, that tells you that there's a tremendous amount of pressure in the marketplace at that point. If there's high volume and prices are rising, everybody is coming in. That's essentially, that's when the public begins to participate uh, really aggressively. There's an old theory in the stock market that when the stock market makes the front page of the newspaper, go against it because whatever put it there peaked by the fact that it made the front cover of the newspaper. The other rule that I always try to argue is that there's no shame in taking a profit and leaving something on the table for somebody else. Because again, where we talk about the bulls and the bears, they're not trying to take the whole move. They're leaving something for the pigs at the end. You know, in that sense, the people that really get excessively greedy end up buying it. For a while, they're right, it goes higher, they hang on because they want just a little bit more. When the successful trader in the marketplace is the one that says, thank you very much, I'm going to take this profit, maybe I'll come back later. You don't get profits if you don't take them. But Canada's most visible guru is Dr. Morton Shulman, TV personality, money letter columnist, best-selling author. Using an investment approach that is fundamentally different from McAvity's, he's made and kept $40 million. Well, everyone's looking for the answer in the stock market. You know, if you could find the guru, Granville, when he came along, was writing, do what, guru, do what the guru says and you'll do well. Gurus, uh, unfortunately, have clay feet, and they, after a while, they all falter, they make mistakes, and then you lose faith in the guru. But if you could find some mechanical guru, wouldn't that be wonderful? Now, if we can just make a chart of what the stock has done over the past six months, or a year, or two years, and if that would somehow tell us magically what it's going to do over the next six months and two years, after all, the moon does the same thing every year, why shouldn't the, the stocks? <laughs> and it's that spurious logic that leads people to do these dumb things, and you see people at this very moment, you mentioned McAvity. McAvity has, has, has charted gold, and he said, gold is going up, according to my charts. Yet I have a, a chartist, a very prominent chartist in Toronto, uh, from, uh, I think it's from McLeod Young Weir, it's either McLeod or Nesbitt, who has done, produced the same charts, and so this, they prove that gold is going down. The problem is the chartists can't read their own charts. <laughs> But the show that's done the most to popularize investment for the little man is Wall Street Week. It's sort of a talk show for investment gurus, and it's seen by more than 10 million viewers in the United States and Canada. One week last summer, the show was produced from the floor of the Toronto Stock Exchange, and one of the guests was C. N. McAvee. But the real star is the show's host, Lou Rukeyser. He has to be very careful about which stocks are discussed on the show. No, I try and stay out of the short-term game because we, we, with over 10 million viewers each week, if I got into that myself, people would think I was trying to make it happen. <laughs> I think in the longer run, over the yeah. course of this decade, uh, the stock market is going to be greatly higher. So I think both the U.S. and Canada are on an upward swing economically, even though in gloomy times it's not always obvious. And I think that a in both countries, the trend toward uh, a greater emphasis on the private sector a little less hostility to business, a little less hostility to profits. All that's good for the countries, it's good for the economies, and it will be good for the stock markets too. Stock trading began in earnest about 300 years ago in the coffee houses and taverns of Amsterdam, Frankfurt, and London. The moneyed and the merely curious gathered in the same spots every day to drink and gossip and swap securities. In England, by the 18th century, this disorderly rabble had moved to more permanent quarters the Royal Exchange in the city of London. On Wall Street, even into this century, outdoor trading continued at the New York Curb Exchange. In Canada, for more than a century, the Toronto Stock Exchange has reflected the growth of Canadian resources and Canadian industry. But until the 1960s, at least, Bay Street was also the world's leading purveyor of outrageous penny stock swindles. 
There were bucket shops which took your money and simply stole it. There were boiler rooms, rooms full of long-distance telephone pitchmen peddling worthless moose pasture to widows in Wisconsin and dentists in Dubuque. But the Windfall Mine Scandal in 1964 triggered a Royal Commission inquiry and sent a leading mining promoter named Viola McMillan to jail. The shockwaves forced Bay Street to clean up its act. Mining promoters moved to Vancouver. Bay Street put away its white shoes, bought a conservative pinstripe suit, and did its best to act respectable. Today, Bay Street is not only a handmaiden to industry, it's an industry itself. The Toronto Stock Exchange handles about 80% of all trading done in Canada. More than $20 billion worth of trades last year alone. 12 halves of March 1589, 13 April 194, 13 October 107. But big investment firms like McLeod Young Weir don't just trade stocks, they also trade bonds. Pieces of paper that governments and companies issue when they want to borrow money. Every third Tuesday, the government of Canada borrows another billion dollars or so, partly to pay interest on our $35 billion deficit. McLeod is one of Ottawa's sales agents, so the bond traders ride the telephones, urging their clients to lend even more money to a spendthrift government. The bond trading department is run by a whiz kid who likes to hire traders who are amateur athletes because they already know how to win and lose. 32-year-old Gordon Cheesebro. The salesmen right now are phoning their accounts to see if guys want to buy tonight before the pricing or uh, whether they're going to wait for the pricing. The traders, we already have positions anyways in the market, so we're trading against those is how we see the new issue going. All businessmen deplore government deficits, but McLeod is happy to earn commissions on government bond issues, which make that deficit even bigger. But other McLeod departments are still losing money. When McLeod overestimated public demand for a new issue of Xerox stock, it cost the firm a million and a half dollars. Ian Delaney. There's been three or four uh, transactions which uh, we'll remember for a long time, uh, Xerox Canada being one of them. Uh, a joint account with three underwriters, uh, we being one of the three underwriters. Um, and we just misjudged, plain, pure and simple. We just misjudged the, uh, the capacity of the marketplace at the price at which we wanted to sell those securities. And uh, the long and the short of it is, after a very nervous two-month period, we ended up liquidating those securities that we had bought with the intention of selling at $19. We, we and in fact, cleaned it up at $16, which on a lot of shares, at $3 a share, is a significant loss. And uh, comes with the territory. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's in the nature of the business. They're not all winners. Uh, in that case, uh, <clears throat> all of us were just dead wrong. Delaney cannot afford another bad guess. Where we're going to want to get to tomorrow night is we are going to want to, to put to you a transaction. When Delaney commits McLeod to buy several million mercantile bank shares, he has to be sure his salesman can turn around and sell all those shares to the public. Uh, and which is a tight enough deal in terms of not having sloppy stock around uh, to, to make sure that this thing uh, does not fall away in the aftermarket and it continues to perform. Uh, I think 35 is, is, is our ideal target. 40 really is getting to be too big when we look closely at what our capital structure would look like. OK, so I, I, above 36, I should be extremely cautious. Is that? an instruction that I could have? Yes, that is an instruction that you can have, that our ideal is 35. Diana? That, that we are... Take some coffee. Uh, some coffee. Relatively... In, I would, tell them I'll call them Delaney's chief strength in the underwriting game uh, is his super sense of the market. But there are bigger boys waiting to push their way into the playground. Uh, and their main strength is lots of money. 30, 30, 5, no, 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 no. We're, we're not getting into that kind of nonsense. Okay. Um, but... Uh, I mean, that's just a bullshit number. I mean, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have a, a number which looks good on the front page of the prospectus. Uh, all right. Uh, well, what's going on? Okay, I'm talking... Yeah, I'm talking to the Financial Post about this brass can thing. The latest entrant uh, is brass can, controlled by the billionaire uh, brothers, Edward and Peter Bromfman. Brass can, by the way, have told the Financial Post that they have set up this company because we and Gandhi are not in the underwriting business. All we are is in the agency business for the purpose of gouging huge spreads 
uh, with no liability. Uh, this is, and this, she's going to be saying all that stuff in her article. And I say, screw it, I've had it. The newspapers yeah, already okay. have the story, and Tom Kearns right, clears his reaction in advance all, with McLeod's and, lawyers. You know, just to make sure that we have the nuances and the facts and all this kind of stuff, right? I'm going to talk to Jim Bailey uh, in his capacity of the thing, and then I'm just going to come out and say that it's just all a crock. And, you know, we're playing under two different sets of rules, and uh, we're not, you know, we're constrained by ownership restrictions, we're constrained by regulated environments. Anyway, you know what I'm going to say. Underwriting is the process of raising money for firms that need expansion capital. It's Bay Street's bread and butter. Not only the Bronfmans are casting covetous eyes on Bay Street, the big banks are also invading the investment dealer's traditional turf. So are foreign financial institutions. Taylor and Kearns think they could fight the big boys if they teamed up with some large international firm. 10% of McLeod's shares are already owned by Shearson American Express, a mighty U.S. financial conglomerate. But the government won't allow Shearson to buy a bigger share of McLeod to create a powerful international partnership. Tom Kearns feels like he's got one hand tied behind his back. Well, it's been coming for a long time. I mean, what, what's happened to us basically is that we're getting caught in a regulatory squeeze. And uh, I don't mind the competition. Uh, I don't mind the the shit kicking, which we've been taking in a competitive environment. But what I do mind is not being able to do anything about it. That's, that's the difficulty. What can you do? I mean, what well, I think that the government has, governments, regulators, have, everybody's got to be treated the same. I mean, if these vast pools of capital are going to be permitted to enter the bulk of our industry and compete with us, then we've got to be able to make our own ownership arrangements in any way that we want to. Or alternatively, they've got to be they've got to subscribe to the same ownership arrangements that we've got, you know, and that's that. You know, we don't need any lessons in what we want to do. What we can't do is do it. And uh, we'd love to be part of an international consortium, and, uh, and and we're precluded from doing that. Uh, when you sum it all up, it's in terms of gross profit for the firm. It's been very tough. Uh, last uh, three or four months. Uh, we, we Our fiscal year end is September 30, and from September 30, 1983, through to um, about April or May of 1984, we enjoyed an extremely high level of profitability, but it's been tapering off rapidly since, and, uh, and to the point today that we're, we're just, you know, counting the pennies and, and uh, really struggling to, uh, to keep it in the black. And uh, struggling harder than we have struggled for some years, I might, I might say. Taylor built up McLeod by expanding when everyone else was pulling in their horns. In this lousy market, he's still doing it. A lot of gall is one key to success in the investment business. Another is a talent for keeping secrets. We have a rule. I hope it's truly enforced. If people were found to be discussing our business in the elevator or outside that they would be dismissed from the firm because our business is built upon confidence. Taylor is flying to Trois-Rivières, where McLeod is opening yet another branch office. Quebec used to be known as a province where people kept their money hidden away in mattresses. Today, it's becoming a province of stock market players. It's not surprising that the town's business establishment turns out en masse for the reception. Part of the reason is generous provincial tax breaks, which encourage Quebecers to invest in Quebec companies. With storefront brokerage offices sprouting across the province, it's the closest thing in Canada to people's capitalism. So why, why is it we have such a vast area where we have no representation? Because there's nobody living no here. No one lives up there. Yeah. What are you going to sell to the uh, Inuit, the Neskinos? Taylor doesn't speak a word of French, but his firm is growing faster in Quebec than anywhere else Ladies in the country. And gentlemen, I too would like to add my welcome and thanks to you for coming to this reception today. It's an important reception for us at McLeod, important in two ways. One, our business is very much a people business, and we at McLeod are very fortunate to have a leader in Trois-Rivières like Lucien because 
Our House is only as good as the people that represent us. And in this gentleman, we feel we have the very finest uh, leader that we could find to represent us in Trois Rivières. So, Lucien, welcome to the House of McLeod and your associates, and we're just terribly pleased by your decision to join us. Okay. Well, we're gonna know. We have to have another one. Yes. Have a smile. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Montreal used to be the financial capital of Canada, but the English-speaking establishment of St. James Street fled to Toronto after the election of the Separatist Parti Québécois government in 1976. Now a new generation of financiers is rising behind the facade of the old. It's a French-speaking financial community, and McLeod is very much a part of it. McLeod's high-tech offices, high above Sherbrooke Street. So I would say that is probably... Uh, the know, firm's two top salesmen are both French Canadians. 31-year-old Jacques Marais generates more than a million dollars a year in commissions. He splits it 60-40 with the firm and takes home more than $400,000 a year. They print those in a bunch. It's like different from stocks, okay? Marais' partner, Charles Laurent, also generated a million dollars in commissions last year. We issued a couple of days ago the Canada's. That's right. The uh, the the dividends will pay will be paid to you on a quarterly basis, but the rate will be adjusted on a daily basis. Place Victoria, home of the Montreal Exchange. Toronto's exchange does eight times as much trading, but Montreal's exchange is working hard to create new business. When it opened in 1965. Montreal's new trading floor was a proud symbol, Montreal's status as a financial center. But these days, St. James Street feels like a museum. Mighty Montreal firms such as the Bank of Montreal, Royal Bank of Canada, and the CPR once dominated the Canadian economy. But most of them are based in Toronto now, and the proud old headquarters of the Montreal Stock Exchange is now a little theater. St. James Street is a great place for tourists, but it's no place for Anglo-Saxon money. At the other end of the country, the floor traders rise before dawn. The Vancouver Stock Exchange opens for trading at 7 a.m. to stay even with the exchanges in New York, Toronto, and Montreal, three time zones away. The VSC is one of the world's leading markets for junior resource stocks. Most of them represent nothing more than a hole in the ground and a lot of hope. But every once in a while, there's a big winner. And that's what justifies the VSE's existence. It's a market of dreams, where a teenage kid can start out as a board marker and hope to be a millionaire before he's 30. Former floor trader, now in charge of the VSE's trading operations, Mark Foreman. About 270 traders that are trying to get markets on the board on over 2,000 stocks. Most of the traders will get in here around 6.30 and it's what we call our pre-opening. And the markets that are going up on the board now are the best bids and the best offers on each of those 2,000. So you do get a fair amount of activity prior to 7. In Toronto and New York, stocks usually go up and down on the basis of earnings, or rumors of earnings. Most VSE stocks don't have earnings, so it's rumors from the drilling site that make the Vancouver market go. The market works on results, drill results. Uh, you know, the old saying down here is, once you know what's going on, then all the activity tends to stop, but it's the... It's the guessing as to whether they've got the property or whether they've got the results uh, that causes our market to react the way it does. The Cloud Young Weir has six traders on the BSE floor, but they're not a major factor in the junior resource market. That distinction goes to a remarkable Vancouver firm called Canarum Investment Corporation and to its president, the famous and flamboyant Peter Brown. Brown knows all about the old days of the BSE, he used to be known as one of Howe Street's bad boys. But Brown changed his act, polished up his image, and brought a measure of respectability and professionalism to the VSE. Today, investors and mining promoters from all over the world 
make pilgrimages to Canarim's lavish offices. If you want to raise money for a mine or an oil well in Vancouver, sooner or later, the buck stops at Peter Brown's cluttered desk. Yeah. Brown is one of the VSE's two godfathers. The other is mining promoter Murray, Murray? Pezum. Hi, Murray. And they always What's stay that, in touch. Uh, block? From you? From uh, personally or? Many Eastern brokers still regard the VSE that Brown okay. dominates as a bear pit of fraud and manipulation. I tried to reach you. But Brown is proud that he's stolen so much business from Toronto. There was a huge pent-up demand. People wanted to speculate that companies needed money. I mean, it was just a natural marketplace. It had to grow. And, uh, and so we, we filled a vacuum. That was one. The other one is that we moved quickly. Is that when people came to us with a financing or a problem or a need, we'd expedite it. They got an answer the same day. And, and, and once we decided, we'd expedite it. And I, I think that was a, and certainly in the early years, that was a big part yes. of the growth. Guys would be spending a year or two years trying to get a deal financed in Toronto. They'd come here, and once we'd made up our mind we wanted to go, we'd get the whole deal done in two or three weeks. There are 20 millionaires on Canarim's sales staff. They operate as independent business people, paying their own office expenses, and sometimes putting together their own mine financing deals. Being an upwardly mobile firm, we've attracted a hundred odd people with five years or more experience with national firms who are aggressive, upwardly mobile uh, guys. And we have sort of wanted to make a home for the entrepreneurially inclined broker. But we like to assign a salesman or a group of salesmen to the active venture capital accounts so that day to day we really are in touch with what's going on. When we're involved in a company, uh, we know, I mean, we're involved. We, we're in day to day touch with them. Pegasus when Bob Friedland needed Washington to raise money to complete his gold mine in New Mexico, he came to Peter Brown. This five million financing that we just did was half Canadian, half London. And the next five million will be either a convertible to venture or a dollar or a gold convertible bond in London. Five million piece of cake. We're predicting originally about 70% ultimate recovery. We Brown is the modern equivalent of the grub staker. He gets proposals every day from promoters who need money to drill on geologically promising properties. The money comes from large and small investors who buy the shares that Canarim brings onto the market. After that, it's a pure crapshoot. Before we can finally quantify the data, but you can look at the recovery of gold over time and it's a very very steep ground. Now, very if steep. you can get 70 percent in one year is it worthwhile to go another full year to get Absolutely. the other 20? Oh, yeah. uh, in heat bleaching since you have no mechanical cost as long as the marginal cost of electricity to drive the pumps is less than the marginal recovery of gold you keep right on going. The cash flow of this thing is going to be immense. This thing will be in full production by April. It needs five million more full production. That's it. Full production by April and it could cash flow buck and a half to go this year. In Vancouver, stock ownership has become a populist phenomenon. It started when the BC government in 1979 gave free shares in BC Resources Investment Corporation, locally known as BRIC, to every BC resident. Because of the BRIC giveaway, there are more shareholders in BC than in any other province. For small investors, even those who've been burned many times, Hope springs eternal. Every morning, John Ness comes to the VSE's observation gallery and visits his stocks, the way a new father visits the maternity ward. Oh, I usually just follow the penny stocks, really, the real small ones. Like many small investors, John's got a system. Only I wish I'd have bought that Butler Mountain when it was in the pennies. I looked at it, but it was too cheap then. <laughs> Where is it gone now? It's three dollars now, so it's a little too expensive now. So I lost out on that one. <laughs> I, I've seen how many is on the bid side and who, who, which houses are bidding and how many is on the sell side. But I have been fooled by that too because I remember watching a $5 stock and the one side was all bid. <laughs> uh, that thing went from $5 down to 30 cents. I never got involved in that one, but so you can't rely on that either. You know, pretty tricky. <laughs> Most people don't use common sense in their investing. Why? Why? Because they follow the mob. Or they think they can... I mean, a few years ago, high-tech was in. Everybody was buying high-tech at 100 times earnings. I think the Mitel disaster, uh, as one example, I was preaching it was way too high, and people said I was crazy. Uh, then there was the gambling casinos. Everyone was buying gambling casinos. And uh, then we went through the oil. People go, these things go in, in waves. And uh, 
public interest seems to follow a certain group of stocks, then they lose interest and they just slide back, and then the suckers follow the next high, high multiple group of stocks. Everyone thinks they can make it quick. Is it Everybody wants a 10 cent stock that's going to 100 bucks, and that's not the way it works. But if penny stocks are an unreliable road to riches, there's always the options and futures markets. Here, in one corner of the trading floor of the Toronto Stock Exchange, they're trading bond futures. In a futures deal, they're trading contracts which commit the owner to buy or sell a commodity at a specific price by a specific date. But unlike the stock market, you can borrow most of what you bet. The leverage is fantastic. You can put down as little as a penny to bet a dollar. Chicago is the world center of speculation in commodities. This scene may strike you as irrational, but you can make a lot more money betting on the future price of pork bellies than you can raising pigs. And you don't have to place your bets on farm commodities. You can also bet on the future price of stocks, the movement of the stock market as a whole, or the future value of various currencies. If you had been right about, for example, the US dollar, and not very many people were, and had foreseen the strength it was going to, it was going to pick up in early 1984, by investing as little as $10,000, you could have turned into a million bucks in 90 days. Tremendous leverage, tremendous leverage. Uh, but it's, it's a two-way street. August 3rd, unpredictable as always, the stock market that's been a wet blanket for many months suddenly catches fire. There were no tears on Wall Street today. The New York Stock Exchange all but exploded in a frenzy of buying. And by closing time, a record 236 million shares had changed hands. The stock stampede was fueled by the unemployment figures and by a report on the nation's money supply, both of which indicate that the U.S. economy's rapid growth is finally slowing. In Toronto, in turn, happy days are here again. Down, Toronto's trading booms almost as dramatically as New York's. Like stampeding cattle, investors all over the world suddenly and mysteriously decide that it's time to start buying. Just before I came up, they were trading about a million shares a minute. Uh, you said 126. I was four minutes behind you. At a strategy lunch in McLeod's boardroom, That's a lot jubilation of reigns. We can't get anything from the floor. The, uh, everything is behind, but uh, they'll have a good time. They'll have another record day, it seems to me. Traders are terrible people because they, they go from black to white, from worst to best. And that seems to be a case again. Uh, I think that we, th we felt <clears throat> in, the me in the meetings we had held in the morning that uh, when this market decided to turn itself around, we wouldn't be surprised to see a 50-point day on the Dow. Uh, it took a day and a half to do that, but nevertheless, it is there. And there are some of those of wild optimists, uh, optimists in New York now, particularly at Shearson, who I heard them talking before I came up, who are talking perhaps of a medium-term uptrend of as many as 500 points. Not realistic at all, but nevertheless, when you get into a good market, that's the kind of talk you keep going around, and it's that kind of talk that helps carry it on. And I don't know where it stops, but uh, typical of election year, typical of a dramatic turnaround, and we've seen it before, and uh, we'll try and remember next time that we see the Dow down below uh, 1080 that uh, this is the kind of thing that we can expect to happen again, and it will. Three or four or five times more in my lifetime, I hope. I'm in New York right now, 192 million, setting records every minute. 50,000 walkers, 24. In the afternoon, the buying madness shows no signs of abating. Fred Ketchum's traders start an office pool on how many shares will be traded that day on the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> All right, what have I got? 224 million. TD, Scotia, Commerce Bank. All Look at them all in here like flies. All in here like flies. New York, volume. Where would you buy them last time? 10? Open the stock. 242 is available. Okay, now go buy 50 million shares of AT&T. It's not that they're compulsive gamblers. It's just that they can't pass up the chance for a nice little side bet. 222 is available. I'll take 222, Brian. There you go. The final volume in New York was a record-breaking 236 million shares. In Toronto, at the 
final siren, the exchange traded 15,460,000 shares. Not quite a record, but close. The ticker was running half an hour behind most of the day, and the computers will be running all night, crunching today's remarkable numbers. By the following week, markets around the world slumped back into their former lethargy. The buying panic of August 3rd turns out to be just a blip. It was great fun, but it was just one of those things. September 4th at the Taylor Farmhouse. Election night. And Austin Taylor, a Tory to the toes of his wingtip shoes, watches the results roll in. The thing about the uh, conservative organization in this province is that we, we really keep it... Uh, Taylor doesn't like to admit it, but his firm is up to its neck in politics. In Vancouver, he was Bill Bennett's political bagman. And now, McLeod acts as the B.C. government's official money raiser. The firm also acts as fiscal agent for Ontario, for Nova Scotia, and for several other provinces. It's not pure coincidence that most of these provinces happen to be ruled by Tories. Bring you up to date with what has happened tonight. Brian Mulroney has led the Conservatives to what looks like to be one of the biggest election victories in Canadian history. This calls for a phone call to New York, to Austin's brother-in-law, who just happens to be William F. Buckley, Jr., one of America's leading conservative commentators. Hi, Bill. Yes, a landslide for the conservatives. Uh, yes, the, out of the 75 seats in Quebec, uh, 61 are now leading or elected conservatives and 14 liberals, Yeah, which is unbelievable. Yeah, it is incredible. The whole uh, country, is, uh, so far we only know Manitoba East, but it's an absolute massive landslide. You know, I'm not the Monday morning quarterback. Uh, the Bay Street has always believed the Trudeau government was bad for business. Will Brian Mulroney make Canada safe for capitalism, as his friend Ronald Reagan did in the U.S.? Well, when you lead a party to the type of landslide uh, he's achieved, no one other, other than he will call the shots. Taylor spends 14 hours a day at his job. On his own acres, nature itself acts as a tranquilizer. As I've become older, I find relaxation in reading, uh, listening to music, walking playing with my dogs, looking at my horses, I've stopped riding now. I fantasize about losing 75 pounds and returning to riding. Essentially, uh, I like to perhaps have dinner with a few close friends, play bridge, but essentially be very private. Professionals like Austin Taylor succeed in the stock market because they're much closer to it than we are. So how can the small, less informed investor protect himself? Morton Schulman. You have to diversify. I mean, if, if so you're reading the money letter, for example, you go and the old Schulman says buy uh, XYZ oil, and you take everything you got and put in XYZ oil, and this happens to be a clunker, which I picked, and it goes to nothing. Not likely, but it, you know, and it's, it's, it's a possibility. Uh, pretty awful, but if you happen to divide your assets among the various recommendations, which leading brokerage houses or leading investment analysts or myself make you'll do very well well basically there's three principal animals in the marketplace Ian McAvity the bulls are the, the people that chase the market up the bears are the people that chase the market down and the pigs are the animals that the bulls and the bears eat at both extremes the, the top of the market is when people come and rushing in I've got to have it and they just grab for it and likewise, you get panics at bottoms where the pigs are throwing it out because it's never going to come back. But essentially, the three key players are the bulls, the bears, and the pigs. And remember, the key thing is you've got to be a little bullish sometimes, a little bearish other times. Today's pig is tomorrow's bacon. But if you are a loser, you are not going to stay in the game. Andy Sarlos. If you are a winner, you have to be prepared to take losses. Somebody told me that there are three ingredients necessary if you want to remain a speculator. Number one, you have to have a good box of mallocs to keep your assets down. 
Number two, you have to have resilience to come back when they knock you down. And number three, you have to enjoy the game. And I think unless you have these three ingredients, market can be a very frustrating place to be. I don't think there's any question that... Lou Rukeyser. ...the period you're talking about, the market will, in the immortal words of J.P. Morgan, fluctuate. So long, sad times, so long, sad times, we are rid of you at last. Sometimes the music is a dirge, sometimes it's jazzy and red hot. But the dance of the markets never stops. Happy days are here again, the skies above us clear again. Let us sing a song of cheer again, happy days are here again. All together, shout it now, there's no one here can doubt it now. Let us tell the world about it now, happy days are here again. Your cares and troubles are gone, there'll be no more from now on. Happy days are here again, the skies above are clear again. Let us sing a song of cheer again, happy days are here again.